Welcome back to our series on Bach's Orgelbüchlein. Today we're looking at one of the Easter chorals, Jesus Christus, unser Heiland, der den Tod überwand. This is one of those pieces where if we were playing it without reference to the hymn text itself, then we would probably play it a lot quieter and more meditatively than we would do when we actually have the text in front of us. Because the text is a great Easter hymn. It says that Christ has conquered the power of death uh, and we should rejoice. But there's just that last line of the text which injects an entirely different note into it, which says, Kyrie eleison, Lord have mercy upon us. And speaking of which, have you noticed that B flat in the tenor part in bar eight? It comes at you completely out of the blue. It's an attention grabbing, pungent, remarkable harmonic moment. And that coincides exactly with the start of the line, Kyrie eleison. Now, would that have been something that people would have noticed? Or is it something that just a musicologist would comment on? Yes, of course it's something that everybody would have known. We've said before that people knew these hymns inside out. They knew the texts. They knew the melodies. They were a part of everyday life. And anybody that in Bach's day that was hearing this piece would have been at least subconsciously following the text in their minds as they heard this choral melody so, clean, so plainly and clearly across the top. And they would have been perfectly aware that as that B-flat hit them, that was the moment which introduced the Kyrie eleison. So you don't have to be a Bach specialist, you don't have to be a informed organist or musicologist to appreciate that. Anybody in Bach's day would have been struck by it. Tempo is straightforward enough. The chorale melody needs to have that sense of flow and connectivity. So it has to be four in a bar. But at the same time, the triplets, for example, in the pedals in the opening, will just limit the speed a little bit because they don't want to be rushed. So there will be a natural balance between the two. Registration. I think this is one of those occasions where the dramatic nature of the chorale text proclaiming the victory of Easter Day demands something equally dramatic and special for registration. I'm going to use a trumpet and a mixture just to make it uh, sufficiently bright and sufficiently powerful. Ornaments, there's just the one trill, I think, in bar six, and that is slightly tricky because it's part of a descending scale, and so either you're going to have to tie the G over into the ornament or else start on the main note. I'm going to start on the main note because the triplet itself doesn't give you a lot of time to tie over the upper auxiliary. So I don't think we should have a bad conscience at all about starting that trill on the main note. So one textual issue, if you look at the first beat of bar five, you'll notice that it simply doesn't add up. The melody line has a dotted quaver and semiquaver against three quavers in the pedals and a crotchet and a quaver in the inner voices. So what's all that about? Well, first of all, we have to say that 18th century musicians were not necessarily as picky as we are about everything having to add up. It's a bit like spelling in 18th century books. Our author will quite happily spell the same word in a variety of different ways within the same book, sometimes even within the same sentence. And provided everybody knew what it meant, it was fine. And similarly with note values, it was quite conventional to write dotted quaver and semiquaver to match a crotchet and quaver triplet. And usually that would be accommodated so that they all fell together. What makes it look slightly odd here is that the inner parts are written as crotchet plus quaver. So if Bach is meaning crotchet plus quaver in the melody, why not write it? And there are two possible answers here. The first possibility is that Bach wasn't intending crotchet plus quaver in the melody, that the semiquaver was intended to fall after the quaver in the inner parts. That possibility seems a little unlikely to me because it's uncharacteristic. 
I'm not going to rule it out. Bach, of all people, could be uncharacteristic when he wanted to be. But it's not what I'm going to choose to do. The other possibility which I find more likely is that we've seen and commented time after time in this series that leaps of a third in the choral melody are filled in with a passing note, nearly always written as dotted quaver, semiquaver. Here we have the only occurrence in this piece of a leap of a third in the melody, and as always Bach fills it in with his passing note and just automatically writes dotted quaver and semiquaver because it's what he always does. And that universal convention of dotted quaver and semiquaver being accommodated to triplets means that even if he noticed it at the time, he didn't need to bother correcting it because it meant the same thing anyway. I'm quite happy with that explanation. We might add, as an alternative, that the piece has a dual time signature of common time and 12-8, and the 12-8 looks in the manuscript as though it might have been written in separately. It's got a sharper quill than the C, or else it's used less pressure, which might have meant that Bach originally intended there to be four crotchets in a bar, and that he wrote out the entire choral melody first, and then dotted all the notes once he decided on the 12-8 accompaniment, which would have made the dotted quaver and semiquaver perfectly correct, and that it was simply left there once everything else had been dotted. That does sound like an appealing idea, except for two things. Firstly, Bach has left uncharacteristically much room between his crotchets, more maybe than he would have left had he been intending a semiquaver accompaniment. But secondly, it's far from certain that this was Bach's method of operating anyway. There's a lot to suggest that he composed all the parts concurrently. But it's still a possibility, but my suggestion that this was Bach's automatic filling in a third gesture seems eminently reasonable, and I'm sticking with it. But the point is, I'm going to play the dotted quaver semiquaver as a crotchet and quaver today. You can choose yourself what you'll do.